my brother. Appreciate that. Good morning, everybody. Um, all praise and honor and glory goes to God for whatever's done that's good in life. Um, through God, we can do all things. Is that in the Bible? And we're going to talk about today distorted thinking. We all have it. I've been teaching it for years, and I have it. <laughs> okay? So if you sit there and say, well, well, this doesn't pertain to me, well, it will. And, but I like to let the Scriptures speak for themselves this morning, okay? If you have a cell phone like I do, and most of you do, would you reach in there and clip it off? I was teaching not too long ago, actually, and um, <laughs> I got a very, very important phone call that I had to take once I answered it right in the middle of class, and that's really quite embarrassing. It's not that my preaching is going to be outstanding because it's going to be very different than you're hearing uh, Pastor Tom on Sunday mornings. I can assure you that. Um, I met him a few months back. He was doing a book signing at Sugar Creek Baptist. That's where I'm a member. And so I met him, had knew of the name, and his connection was KCB Radio. And um, when I met him, I said, I need you. And that kind of startled him to begin with. I said, there's some things that you know that I don't know that I need to know. And you can help me. And from that very beginning, we have had a very close relationship. And now he is the academic dean for the school. So not only do we meet on a casual acquaintance basis, but because of his expertise in certain areas that we needed at the school, we have now partnered in a great partnership to bring uh, to, the, actually, uh, by next year to the world through uh, the Internet, an uh, opportunity for people to come through our school and get certified and get a degree. And actually, you get a degree in 25 weeks. And we're the first to ever do anything like that. So we're doing on the cutting edge of many, many things in Christian education. And that's where I come from, is Christian education, because that's what I've been involved in for over 30 years. And, um, but today I want to talk about something that's very uh, close to my heart. And I'm going to be here for a little bit, but I'm very interactive. So if I'm down there with you, just know that I'm going to be down there with you in a little bit. That's just the way I am, okay? Uh, I think a teacher needs to be involved with a student. And I think a preacher needs to be involved with the congregation. Do I hear amen? I mean, if you're in a hospital, do you want him to come by and visit you or not? You want him to be involved with you? You want him to come by and visit you? And so I'm going to be visiting with you today. But I want to be up here to give you a little background how this particular subject developed. Some five years ago, um, one of my students was like the founding member of a church they grew over the years to, I think they had around 1,500 people in the service that I preached at. They had two services, one early service and one later traditional service like we're in today. And the uh, pastor had asked me in December if I would come and preach. And uh, I, I love to do that because I don't get a chance to preach a lot because I teach for years every Saturday. My work, sa my work day is Saturdays. I tell all my friends and my family, that please don't call me on Saturdays because that's my work day. And my rest of the week is my research time because I'm retired. I'll be 72 in about three or four more days. And so I've been retired for years, and I do a lot of research and writing on the subject that we teach. But the pastor had called me and asked me would I uh, preach, and I think it's like about the third sa Sunday in December. And I was thinking about what, what would I want to, bring to a congregation of about 1,500 people that would be new and different and uh, something that they would need to hear. Because this pastor was a bishop with uh, pastors underneath him in a very large organization. So obviously uh, they had heard messages on almost anything and everything in life, right? So I said, Lord, what would I teach? And it came to me that the subject matter that we've been teaching for years at school was distorted thinking. Now, well, that's interesting. And some parts of this that you'll hear today came out of that first message 
But what was birthed that was so interesting to me was because of the response to both the morning, early morning service and later the traditional service. I had so many people come up to me saying that message really touched them. And I said to myself, well, there must be something to this more than I even understand. So I thought, well, if it's touching people that much, maybe I should send out an email every Sunday night with just a little page or maybe two pages at the most on distorted thinking. And originally, I was going to talk about distorted thinking in the church, uh, in government, in education, and in health because we have so much distorted thinking in all those four areas. And it's tremendously distorted out there. So what you hear is really not true for the most part. It's true. They'll tell you this, that, and the other about things, and then later on they'll come and tell you, well, you know, that's not good for you. And then later on they'll tell you, well, eggs are fine. Right? Eggs are great. God made the eggs. But they told us for years, don't eat eggs, so it's going to raise your cholesterol. Well, you know what they did? They just lied. Bunch of lying doctors. Okay? So, but when I got into studying the scriptures on distortions in the scriptures, I sent out an email every Sunday night for one year. It's 52 emails. And I never got out of the scriptures with the Bible. I never got to health. I, I never got to government, you know. I, I never got to education, and God knows we have trouble in education. Do I hear an amen in here? Y'all say amen in this church? I'm uh, just, just checking you. Just checking. And because uh, it was so much distortions uh, that I found in the Scriptures that we believe is true, but the Bible does not support it even close to it. But we believe it. Because we've always been taught that. So for the next few minutes, and we'll get out by 2 o'clock at least. I thought, that's for those who were sleeping. Um, and we're going to have some scriptures on the, on the uh, screen. But I want you to get out your Bibles. Who's got your Bible? I like to see Bibles. Raise it up. Let me see your Bible. Now, this is the Bible church. All right, Tom's done a good job. Hmm? Tom's done a good job. I'm going to leave my phone down here. Now, y'all don't let me forget my phone, okay? Because my wife will ask me, where is your phone? Okay, and I say, I left it at church. No, I don't want to do that. Um. How many of you, when you were a child, had asked your parents for a bicycle for Christmas? Ra raise your hand. Did, you're smiling. I like that smile you have, brother. H how old were you, and what color was it when you got that bicycle? Yes. Now, w were you looking good? On your, were you pedaling, were you looking good pedaling that bicycle, a green bicycle? Was it after Christmas? Christmas, yeah. Now, you can, can y'all see him? Is an eight-year-old with a new bicycle after Christmas. I mean, you were looking good in, in the neighborhood. I guarantee you other kids will look at your new bicycle. Now, I'm making a point. So y'all just stay with me, it's okay. Okay? Right? So we're going to look at a scripture, Ephesians 1, 3. Get your Bible out. Y'all got your Bible there. And I think Laura's going to put it on the screen as well. So we're going to read that scripture, and we're going to look at that in relationship to this new bicycle. Because it's very, very interesting. God gave me this analogy uh, several years ago, and I used it in this, these two services, and it really rang true um, to these people. So in somebody's most holy voice, could I have you uh, read that scripture out of your Bible 
and then we have it on the screen together. And we're going to read it together on the screen, but I want somebody to just read it. Would you sit you the bicycle man? Okay, let's read that together, can we? Do it together. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now, it's something very crucial that we have not been taught very well at all, unfortunately. When we read the scriptures, we need to be aware of the verb tense. Everybody say verb tense. The verb tense is crucial. So the verb here is what? Who has blessed. So when you're reading the scriptures, you want to take a pen, a highlighter, you know, something, circle it. But if it's a past tense verb, it's something you already possess. Is this true? If you have it, you have it. Everybody say, I have it. You, ha you have it because the word says you have it. So what do you have? You have already been blessed in Christ Jesus with what? Ever. Not some. Every spiritual blessing. Now here's what we do in church because that's what we've been taught. We ask God to bless us. True or false? How many of y'all, raise your hand, has asked God to bless you? And your family, and the missionaries, and the pastor, and the sick, and on and on and on and on we go. Every day. Thank you. That's because I'm going to the bicycle in a minute. Thank you. Now, what would your parents say to you if the next morning you woke up and you asked them for the new bicycle? What would they say? Ah. You see where I'm going with the story? But the next morning, though. You're going to wake up and ask your parents for a new bicycle. And what are they going to say? You see what God is saying to y'all today? Get up in the morning and ride your bicycle. It's true. It's true. If you have already been blessed, then you have already been blessed. Now, here's the, here's the secret. We don't take it for granted. But our prayer time is not asking, but it's giving thanks for. Did y'all get that? It's not asking to be blessed. It's not praying blessings on somebody. But what it is, it says, Father, I thank you today that I have already been blessed in your son, Christ Jesus, with every spiritual blessing. That's the way I pray. Now, this sermon is not about prayer, but it is. Because you will understand today how to pray better than you've ever prayed in your life because you're going to pray now, not for, but because you have, with thanksgiving. Did you get that? Huh? So your praying every day should be with thanksgiving because you have already got it. Did I help somebody? Do I hear a big amen from everybody? One more time, just hear amen. If you've got it, say amen. You've got it. The problem is you never knew you had it, so you kept on asking for it. Is that true? You keep on asking for it, and you already have it. Now, I want to go to another scripture to nail this down solidly for you. Go to 2 Peter 1.3. Go to 2 Peter 1.3. Because this one is even better than that one, and that's kind of hard to say that that's not so good, but it is. But this is even better in 2 Peter 1.3. Now, my bicycle, man, I want you to read that in your most holy voice. Have you got it there? 2 Peter 1 3. Got it? Oh, you can read it off the screen. That's fine. Go ahead and read it. Now, let's all read it together because we want to hear ourselves read this. Okay, let it make a change in our soul, okay? Seeing that his divine power 
has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Wow. Look at the past tense verbs up there. If that won't blow your socks off, come on, guys. So let's try seeing that his divine power has granted, past tense, y'all with me? Has granted to you and me, us, and you can put your name in there, okay? Everything, not some things, everything that pertains to life and godliness. Now, come on, guys. There's nothing else you can pray about. If you got everything for life and godliness, what's left for you to pray about except to give thanks for it? Am I helping somebody today? Where's the amen? Come on, guys. Amen? If you got it, I would hear amen. Thank you. Through the true knowledge of him who called, past tense, you, me and you, us, by his own glory and excellence. Woo! If I won't fire you up, man, your wood is wet. In other words, you've already been blessed. And you've already been given everything for life and godliness. Some of y'all are trying to get holy. Some of y'all are trying to get godly. And you already are. Wow. For some of you, that might have been a revelation this morning. Say, I already have it. Because God gave it to me. It was his mercy and grace. I didn't do anything to deserve it. But he gave it to me anyway. So some of you think you can't receive from God because you just don't. Well, if you knew my life, you know God wouldn't give me anything. Huh? Some of y'all got that mentality. If you just knew my life, uh, God would not give me anything. I, well, you just already, no. No way. Yeah, way. Because he didn't do it because of you. He did it because of Jesus. It wasn't because of your righteousness that you were saved. Let me ask somebody here. Were you fasting and praying for weeks and giving tithes and offerings and come to church regularly and being good to your neighbors and you got saved because of that? How many of y'all fed in that category? You were doing everything right in your life, bless God, and then he saved you. No, you bought your sinners, just like I was. 52 years ago, I've been a Christian 52 years. I've been a Christian longer than some of y'all have been living. You're not even 50 years old, Yanni. You're lucky about 30. He did it. The Bible says, in that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Is that what the Bible says? Huh? In Romans 5, 8? That'd be 8, 5. You know, it's 72, you forget which one goes first, eight of the five. But it's in Romans. I can guarantee you that one. Huh? But there's a real problem with this scripture. It's serious. That we need to talk about. Oh, yeah. Now, I've talked about the good part. But there's a part that pertains to what we do. Connect to what? God has already done for us. So let me point it out to you just in case you might have missed it. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him, 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 through the true knowledge of him. him. We don't know the true knowledge of him. So when we don't know the true knowledge of him, we don't know what we have. Because everything is in him. And that's our problem today because we're just lazy. Can I just be honest up front? 
We don't know what's in the Bible. We don't. That's the reason why people can knock on your door and talk about their religious stuff and you're just as gullible because you don't know what they're really even talking to you about because they got their stuff down. Do they? Do they know what they're talking about? And it'll sound really great. It's, the problem is it's distorted thinking. It's not really true. But it sounds right. Through the true knowledge of him, we must know and how to apply that which God has said is ours. Because, see, it's not, our, it's not yours until you appropriate it. Dr. Tony Evans has said a powerful thing, and I don't know if you know Dr. Evans' teaching or not. Um, he said one of the most profound things that I learned from him about 15 years ago that changed my whole life. And my whole ministry of teaching at the Institute is around these three bullets. And, it, it, and I don't have it on the screen, but if you've got a pen and paper, I'm going to give you a moment to write it down because you ought to write this down because it will change your life because it changed mine. When I heard this, it really changed my life forever because he says there are three important things that you must know to live the successful Christian life. How many of y'all would like to live the successful Christian life? Raise your hand. Now let me hear a big amen. All right, here it is. Number one, you must know who you are. You must know who you are. You must know your identity in Christ. Who are you? Because that's the starting point. Who are you? Okay, your identity in Christ. Now, the best place to find that is going to be Ephesians, the first three chapters, 1, 2, and 3. Chapters 1, 2, and 3. By the way, if you want God to change your life, let me tell you how I can guarantee God will change your life. Is the book of Ephesians. If there was one book I could have out of the Bible, I would take the book of Ephesians over the whole Scriptures. It's called the Queen of the Scriptures, is Ephesians. There are six chapters. The first three chapters is your identity in Christ. Who are you? What do you have? And four, five, and six is now that you know who you are. This is what you go do. So it's who and do. One, two, three is who you are. Four, five, and six is now this is your do. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. Don't expirate your, your don't bring your children to wrath because of the way that you discipline them. Take care of your employees properly. You know, as an employee, take care of your employer properly. It's all, in, all the relationships about life is in those six verses. If you will read those every day, chapter 1, Monday, take a little 3 by 5 card and write on that 3 by 5 card the scripture that pops out at and that's your meditation scripture of the day. Is that one scripture out of that first six or seven verses. The second day, you read chapter 2. And out of that, as you read it, God will pop it out to you, one that will be meaningful to you. And you write that on a 3 by 5 card, and you keep it with you. The second day is your meditation scripture. Day 3, chapter 3. Day 4, chapter 4. And right on through through 6. And you'll be kind of like God. You're going to rest on the 7th. And you're going to come back the next week. And guess what you do? The same thing. You keep rereading it. And another scripture will pop out. And it's a 3 by 5 card. This is the technique that we tell people who pay us money to learn from me. They do. They pay me very well to go to school. Is that right, Julia? She's in the... That's right. She's, that's, she's paid off her credit card. But was it worth it, Julia? It was worth it, see? And it didn't cost you anything. If you don't like it, I'll give you a refund when we have the service at the end. Some of y'all caught that one, didn't you? The rest of y'all were asleep. I may be 72, but I'm not that slow yet. Okay? 
But if you will read the book of Ephesians till you die, God will transform you to be more like him, I can guarantee you. Because he says he watches over his word to perform it. Did y'all know that's in the scriptures? He watches over his word to perform it? In Jeremiah? So when you pray his word, you can be assured that he's going to do something with the prayer because it's his word. When you mumble and grumble and complain to God in your prayer time, he doesn't hear that stuff. Did y'all know it? Because he's going to say, won't you ride your bicycle? Because I've already given it to you. I've already blessed you. So why don't you walk in your blessings and give thanks for it? Am I helping somebody today? Did I drive from Sugar Land for nothing? Huh? I'm really simple and down to earth. This is real stuff. It'll really change your life. I've been doing this for over 30 years, and it works. I wouldn't come over here and tell you something that wouldn't work. That'd be really stupid on my part. Would it not? That'd be so stupid of me to drive from Sugar Land over here and tell you a bunch of stuff that doesn't work. And you tell Dr. Tom, don't ever invite that boy back. He's just about as stupid as the dirt. No, I'm going to give you stuff. If you will do it, will work. Now, the rest of y'all will just say, okay, that was, that was okay. That was different. Hadn't heard that before. And you're just going with your life. You won't read Ephesians every day. You won't pray with Thanksgiving every day. You'll still ask God to bless you. Bless us missionaries. Bless Dr. Tom. And this message did nothing for you or God. Zippo. You might as well slept in, in home this morning. I'm about change. Several years ago, McDonald's changed their chicken nuggets. And around this table, when they filmed these bunch of little kiddos looking at these nuggets in their basket, they always were just looking at it, but nobody would eat. So it had changed. So they didn't know exactly what to do. So they kept looking at it the, as the camera was rolling. And this one kid, he picks up, the chicken nugget, he puts it in his mouth and bites into it. He says, mmm, change is good. And the rest of them just dug in and started eating their nuggets. Did you get the message? I hope you did. Because change can be good by eating into the word of God. Amen? So we're, talk we're just talking about scripture today. Am I helping you? We're not I don't have no... Ju ask you... And, and when we teach, Julia, we do not have opinions. God never asks anybody's opinion down here on this earth, ever. Did he? See, when, when you give people the word of God, you act like God. When you give them the, your opinion, you act just like the devil. He said, amen or oh me. Huh? Yeah, I think it's on me. Because y'all give your opinion about everything. You got an opinion about the government. You got an opinion about the church. You got the opinion about everybody. But God never asked you to give an opinion. So get over yourself. It's okay. And start acting like God. We got a few more goodies. Let's go to the, the third one on our list, Exodus 20, 2 through 6. Exodus 20, 2 through 6. This is another distortion that we have, distorted thinking. And I taught this 20-something years ago as the gospel. I would got it from a, what I felt was a reliable source and my reliable source lied like a dog. But I taught this. Um, and it just wasn't true. I, have y'all ever heard of um, people talk about that they're under a curse? Have y'all heard that term, you're under a curse? Raise your hand. Under a curse? Under a curse? Yeah, you have, yeah. I taught that because I was stupid. I'd got this teaching about being on the curse 
um, from what I thought was a reliable source. And so I put it into my teaching 20 years ago, and, man, I was, I was letting it rip. We all on our curse. Bless God, we need to break the curse. See, um, let me give you just a little insight about hearing preacher preachers preaching their stuff. If they preach you out of the Old Testament and not run to the cross to the other side where Jesus had fulfilled it, they'll preach you into bondage every time. There was nobody free in the Old Testament. You can quote me any time of the day. Was anybody free ever in the Old Testament? Raise your hand. You say, no. No. But see, this came out of the Old Testament that we're on a curse. And when you're born into this world, at birth you are. You're on a curse. At birth. When you're born with mama and you come out, we're called a sinner. Is that the Bible? Is that the Bible? But did you do any sinning to become a sinner? Were you doing any wine, women, and song? Huh? You were born. Okay? But when you are born again from above, uh, John chapter 3, Jesus talking to Nicodemus. Let's see what it says now in Galatians 3.13. Let's, let's take care of that curse in Galatians 3.13. Let's look it up. Galatians 3.13. Let's see what happened. Well, this is good news, guys. See, that other distortions. That's distorted thinking when you believe you're on a curse. If you believe you're on a curse today, I'm going to tell you you can be free with this scripture coming up. Okay? Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Do I hear any amens? Have it become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And by the way, the tree there is actually wood in the, in the Greek. Everybody hangs on wood. So it was a wood cross. That is a past tense verb. You see it. When you were born into this world, you were born as a sinner. When you accepted Jesus... Born again, born from above, the curse was immediately right then and there broken. Amen? You are no longer under a curse. So if you have believed that you and your family were under a curse, I got good news from you from the Word of God. You are not under a curse. Is that good news? That's good news. Because there are churches who have the big high-powered pastor who comes on in a special Sunday night service and people line up by the hundreds to get the curse broken off of their families. You may not have been in one of those services, but I go to all kinds of churches and all kinds of services. But that actually happens around the world. That pastor is going to break the curse on their family, their finances, their relationships, their marriage. And on and on it goes. And guess what? It's already been broken. All those people standing in line acting like stupid people because they don't know the Word of God. Just like I taught it 20 years ago to my classes, I thought I was doing the right thing. See, the problem is people will say, well, that's in the Word of God. I have people always talk about that all the time. Any of y'all got an NIV Bible? Raise your hand if you've got an NIV. Nearly imperfect version. It's terrible. They even leave out whole, whole, whole scriptures. Y'all know that? Yeah, NIV, nearly imperfect version. Let me give you a good example of that. For the book of Romans, he'll always use the word sin nature when you're talking about the word F-L-E-S-H, flesh. The word flesh in the Greek is S-A-R-X. Write that down and go research what sarx means because it's going to really surprise you. S-A-R-X, sarx. Sarx means flesh. But sarx does not mean sin nature. 
And NIV will always translate flesh or sarx from the original language of Greek to the word sin nature. You only have one nature. Either you are in Adam, lost, or you have been translated from darkness into light into Jesus, and now you have no longer an old sin nature because you now you have the nature of God. Amen? You understand that? You only have one. You don't have an old sin nature. Here's another one, oxymoron. I'm a sinner saved by grace. That is the most stupid thing I've ever heard in my life. Yes, was. You're not a sinner. Because if you're saved by grace, you're no longer a sinner, are you? You know what you are? A saint who sometimes sin. Does that help somebody? When you hear the admonition from Paul to those little churches in Asia Minor, like Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians and Romans and all that, what does he start out with on the first line? I'm writing to the saints in Ephesus. Y'all know your Bible? Y'all got some gray hair here. Come on, Bible students. Don't you know the Bible? I'm writing to the saints in Ephesus. I'm writing to the saints in Galatia. Right? Is that what he says? Is that in the Word of God? Did he ever say, I'll write to the sinners? Did he ever say that? No. So what do we go around saying that we're a sinner? Now, if you're a sinner, I want you to come up here and I want you to get saved today. We get, get, we get take that care, we take care of that today. If you think you're a sinner, you need to come up here and talk to me today. Because you really got distorted thinking. Because you're a saint according to what God says about you, who sometimes sin. True or false? Do y'all sin? Amen? But you're a saint. Yeah. Colossians 3.3 3 says, my life is hidden in Christ and God. My life is hidden in Christ and God in Colossians 3.3. 3. Well, what is my life that's hidden in Christ and God? But if our life is hidden in Christ and God, it has to be perfect. Because God is perfect, sinless, holy. But what part of me is hidden in Christ is what we don't know because we were never taught that. It's your spirit. And your soul is messed up just like mine. But your spirit is perfect. It's already in Christ. Can I just drop a bomb on you? You're not even going to get a new spirit in heaven because you already got it. You can't get no more than Jesus. You think you're going to get a better Jesus? Come on! I'm real. Have y'all figured out I'm real? I'm just about the word. I have no opinions. Colossians 3, Colossians 3, 3 says, My life is hidden in Christ in God. That's my spirit. But Romans is another story. Because Paul is still writing to us. And he says in Romans 12, what does he talk about? Renew your mind. That you may prove that which is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. But, Rome, but in Philippians he says, you have the mind of Christ. Is that what he says? So if you have the mind of Christ and you're perfect, you're hidden in him and you're already everything then why is it, what's wrong with Paul? Is he getting senile? And telling that you need to renew your mind in Romans? No, he just knew God and how we were made up. We we're made up of a spirit, a soul, and a body with three parts. We're a tripartite being. Your spirit's perfect, your soul's messed up. And your body just goes along with whoever's in charge. You go get your glass of milk, out of the refrigerator, and you can go down to the bar and have a beer. And your body will go either way, right? Huh? Would the body go either way? One's the mind of Christ, and one's the mind of the soul. 
In fact, James says a double-minded man will not receive anything from God. It's like tossing and turning in the, in, in the waters. Am I helping somebody? Hmm? Tom said I had to get out of here by 1.30. I'm going to go to Genesis 2 7. I'm going to go to Genesis 2 7. We'll talk a little bit about the soul and the spirit. Because this is so, so distorted. Most preachers and teachers and people in most congregations have been taught and believed the soul is immortal. How many of y'all been taught that the soul is immortal? Raise your hand. Don't be embarrassed. Raise your hand if you've been taught that the soul, you think the soul is immortal. Yeah, most of us have. I was taught that. That is lied, but that's okay. Today you can be free. I'm going to teach you how to be free today. Is it okay? Yeah, I'm going to talk about the Word of God. The Word of God will set us free. Huh? When the Son is set free, it's free indeed. So if you, if you got this thinking, you can change. you got distorted thinking here. Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. In the Leviticus, the word the life of the flesh is in the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And this translation of Hebrew word is nephish. Everybody say nephish. Say it with me again, nephish. One more time, say nephish. That means that's the word in the Greek, uh, excuse me, in the Hebrew that means soul. From the original. is nephish. Now, let me tell you about nephish. Nephish is what gives us the personality. It's our mind, will, and emotions. Do you know that your dogs and cats have nephish? Same word. When you look it up in, in the Hebrew about the animals, when you look up in the Greek, it talks about the animals, it's the same word, nephish. They have a soul. You know your dog has a soul. They'll cry over you. Huh? Your cat? Don't they, have, don't they have personality? Come on. Absolutely they do. I mean, a cat's got a personality different than a dog altogether. A dog will come up there and they'll wag their tail and lick and love you, and the cat will come up and, mm, and they'll love you when they want to love you. That's a cat. You're, you know what I'm talking about, huh? You cat lovers know that. They have nephish. They have personality. But nowhere in the scriptures, when you look up nephish and bring it forward, is nephish is eternal. Stephen, when he was stoned, looked up into heaven, and Jesus standing there at the right hand of the Father looking down upon him, and Stephen said he gave up his spirit. Some of y'all read your Bible. What did Jesus do on the cross when he lifted up and he said, I gave up my, thank you very much. The spirit is eternal. The soul is not eternal. And the body will become a resurrected body at the resurrection. We have a personality. My personality is different than Dr. Tom's. Y'all figure that out by now, I'm sure. Yes, that was it. I got different genes. Now, soul is transmuted and brought on to the next generation by the blood. That's how it's brought on. Because, yeah, because you'll see a, a, a man or a woman, and they'll say, oh, he's just an, he's, He's just like his dad. She's just like her mother. Have y'all anybody ever said that before? She acts just like her dad, or he acts just like that. Huh? That's, that came through the blood. 
soul comes to you from your parents through the blood. No blood, no life. That's why we give blood for transfusions, right? No life, no blood, no blood, no life. And that's where your personality comes from one generation to the next generation. Okay? It's through the blood. Now, when we're born from above, we get the DNA of God. Woo! We do. Amen. Isn't that good? We get the DNA of God. We're born from above. We're born of the Spirit. See, my spirit's perfect. See, my soul is just like you guys. It's messed up. I've just been working on mine longer than some of you guys are because I'm older. But all you need help. Did you know all you need help? All, all y'all need help. You do. And the rest of you are just in denial. <laughs> and that's a whole other subject. That's a whole other subject. I hope I'm helping somebody. Let's look at spirit. God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created he him. I wonder if they talk about spirit there. Hmm? Because God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's what the Bible says. Right? Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So God created man in his image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female. He created them with his own image. So image is God's image, is spirit. Now let's take it on home and close it down. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. We need to understand the scripture because people don't know what the old is and don't know what happened with the new. And they have probably memorized this scripture. They know this scripture. They've heard this scripture preached. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new what? The old things passed away, and behold, new things have come. People get saved around the world every day. But they have no idea what was the old that left and what is the new that came. And half the time, the people who are leading them to Christ, they don't have a clue neither. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. So what's the old? The old sin nature that you were born with from mama. You were called a sinner. That's, that's the old. But then if you became a new creation, what happened at the new birth when you got saved from above, born from above, however you want to say it, it was that spirit that you were born with, that was what was changed like that when you accepted Jesus. Now, before you were a sinner, and now you are a saint. The old sin nature is gone, and the new nature of Christ is now in you. I told somebody the other day, I'm not looking for a church, I am the church. Did you know that you're the church? If you don't know you're the church, you need to go read the Bible. I am the church. You, you're the church. How we represent the church is not too well represented sometimes. But we are. And people are looking at us whether we know it or not. How we represent the church. The living church of God. So the old was the old sin nature. The new is your new nature in Christ. And I got to give you two more. because These are really, really good. I say the best for last. 1 Corinthians 6, 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians 6, 16 and 17. This is excellent. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, 
the two shall become one flesh. But 17 is powerful, guys. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. If you are born again from above, you are now one spirit with him. You don't have two spirits. You don't have no three spirits. You don't have God and you don't have your spirit. You don't have the Holy Spirit. You don't have all these spirits. Wake up. You got one. Because your spirit and God's spirit is the same spirit. And the Holy Spirit is in that spiritual arrangement. Christ's spirit lives within you. That's the reason why he says he's closer than a brother. He says he'll never leave you or forsake you. See, in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God would come upon the prophet and he would prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord. Is that the way it worked? But did you ever hear anybody in the Old Testament, I mean, in the New Testament, say, Thus saith the Lord? No. You never hear that language ever because that's obsolete. Christ lives in you. Put your hand right here. Put your hand right here. Say, Christ lives in me. Now close your eyes and just meditate on that. Think about Christ living in you. He's not up yonder someplace. He's right here. Close your eyes and just think about that right here in you. Christ lives right here in me. He's not Old Testament. He's not coming and going. He's, he's right here. Say, he's right here. I know it. Because the Bible says so. Am I helping somebody right here? See, we're always trying to look for God out there someplace. They're, they're whole denomination trying to pray God down. How stupid can that be? We're going to pray God down tonight. Really? He's here. Have y'all, have y'all ever heard somebody pray the anointing of God upon somebody? Y'all ever heard that? The Messiah, the anointed one, that's what he says, the Messiah, the anointed one, lives in me. I'm already anointed. Right? The reason why we don't walk in empowerment because we don't know who we are. That's what Tony Evans said. We don't know who we are. Then we don't know what we have. And here's the big one. We don't know how to appropriate it. That's the third point. We don't know how to appropriate it. We don't know how to write a check. And get it out of the bank. Some of y'all have not made any withdrawals in so long, it's a wonder God hadn't closed your account. Been a Christian years and years and years, and withdrawn anything, just living day by day. Bless God, I'm waiting on heaven. What? Do you realize we're going to reign for a thousand years down here on earth with Christ when he comes back? You've got a job to do. We're going to rule and reign down here for a thousand years. Y'all think you're going to go up there and sit around and drink coffee? we got a job to do. I ain't no retirement. We're going to come back to rule and reign. Y'all know that's in the Bible? Huh? Amen. My favorite. Mm, mm, mm. John 4, 16 and 17. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us 
so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Everybody say this with me. As he is, so are we in this world. Now together. As he is, so are we in this world. One more time. As he is, so are we in this world. One more time. I is. That's right now. He said, where? In heaven? Where? In this world. That's right. He's right here right now. As Jesus is, uh, you are right now. Everything Jesus is, you are. If that won't wake you up, your wood is wet. Huh? As Jesus is, so am I right here, right now. Not in heaven. It didn't say anything about heaven, did it? He says, in this world. See, I'm Bible. If y'all like Bible, you like me. If you don't like Bible, you don't like me. I'm going to tell you. As Jesus is, so am I in this world. My question as I close is this. How are you reflecting Jesus in this world? Oh, ouch. 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 How are you reflecting Jesus in this world? On your job? In your school? With your husband? With your wife? With your kids? Or have you just been doing like most people, playing church on Sunday? It's your duty. Bless God, I've been going to church for 35 years, and I'm there all the time. In fact, I even got those awards from Sunday school. hippity hoopity doo for you. But how are you reflecting Jesus every day in your life, in your family? That's the question on the floor this morning. How are you reflecting Jesus in school? With your friends as you play? That's the, what's on the floor this morning. Let me tell you about decision making. You make a decision every time you come to church. You are for are against what God has said automatically by default. Every one of you will make a decision before you walk out of here today. It's by default. Either you're going to vote yes for him or no, you're not. Is that true or false? By default, you're going to take one way or the other. There's only two, two paths to go. Is that true? We have to decide today that we have distorted thinking. You have it. I have it. And I've been teaching this for 20 years, bless God. And I'm still working on stuff that I had to start thinking on. You all have it. Just some of you have it worse than others. So what are you going to do with Jesus this morning? How are you going to reflect him day by day in the workplace, in the family, with friends? You have to come to that conclusion for yourself as I have to come to my own conclusion about my own life. I can't repent for you. I can't change my mind. Repentance is simply change your mind and go in a different direction. You do know that, don't you? You need to repent this morning. Everybody in this room needs to repent this morning. You do. Not because of me. The Word of God has said this to us. You have distorted thinking. I grew up in the country. In a year when there were two television stations, black and white, and we had an antenna on the outside. And somebody would go out and we would turn it. And they would holler, we got the station. Stop. Now, some of y'all are too young. You don't know what I'm talking about. You think we had cell phones forever. See, it was 
distorted until we could get just right on the signal where we get a clear picture. Otherwise, it was distorted. Y- y'all, anybody remember those days? Uh-huh. And then if you had an electric motor on the top of the television that would do it with electric motor, whoo! We were riding high. See, I go back more than a day. I, I, think, I think I was born at the best times of all the times. But you old folks, don't you, don't you agree? We had the good of the old and old of the good, and now we're in the new millennium of the 21st century. And we get to enjoy that too. So we get a big perspective of life. I'm not asking anybody to come to, to the altar today because all of y'all need to go to the altar where you are and do your own confessions that you have got distorted thinking in areas of your life. But I want you to pray this with me because God will reveal to your mind clearly your distortions. So say this prayer with me. Say, Father God, I give myself to you to reveal to my mind clearly right here, right now, the distortions thinking errors, the distorted thinking that I have in relationship to you and your word. Reveal it to me, and I will repent. I will change my mind. I will change my actions to be like you, to reveal you in wherever I go. Thank you, Jesus, for answering this prayer. Now, I want you to close your eyes and relax. I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit now to reveal to you distortions in your thinking. And whenever you hear the Spirit reveal distortions to you, I just want you to slip up your hand as you hear the Spirit reveal distortions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Spirit is always talking. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Everybody's going to hear. If you can't hear from God, come up and get saved after the service. Thank you. Thank you. If you can't hear your distortions, come up and get saved after the service. God is always speaking. Thank you. Thank you. Now, as you hear those distortions, say this with me. Say, Father God, I repent. I change my mind. I change my actions for my distortions. Now, Holy Spirit, empower me to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That Jesus will be seen in my life every day. Thank you, Jesus. Now, just relax. Because the Spirit of God would now bring peace to your heart about your confession that it's really been done. He will let you know. Now, whenever you know that you know that you know that there's been a change inside of you today, I just want you to slip up your hand because you know God has made a change in your life already that you can go out there. Yeah, amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Well, you know, when Mama cooked the roast, she said it's finished. Come and eat. So I'm going to say to you, uh, it's finished. Go. Go and do the work of the ministry that God has called you to do in your workplace, wherever you are, for what God has called you to do, because your calling and my calling is not the same calling. So we're going to have a song. And if you need to come forward for special prayer, I welcome you for that. Now, I'll be quite honest and upfront with you. I am huge in physical healing. If you need to be physically healed, you need to talk to me. I went through most of my life, and quite frankly, I never saw anybody healed. Because I was taught in my church background and in the seminary where I went, that healing went out with the apostles. Just had a bunch of lying preachers, all I know.
Jesus said he's the same yesterday and today and forever. That's in the Word of God. And who's the healer? Jesus. So if he healed in the past, he's healing today. Come on. Because Jesus does the healing. And if you need to have physical healing today, I just want you to come up here. Don't all of you come at one time because all y'all are sick on some level. And come up here and get healed today physically. Okay? Or mentally, emotionally, or whatever your healing might need to be. Just come on up and I'll lay hands on you. It said the Bible says, the believers lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Is that what the Bible says?